well, welcome everyone once again. This is the last day of the conference. I hope you've been enjoying it so far and uh, thanks for staying with us until the very end. Um, today we have two wonderful sessions once again. Um, very exciting topic. The first topic will focus on data measurement and mitigation uh, of coal mine methane emissions. And in the afternoon, we will discuss how to reconcile strategy and ambition. And we'll hear from uh, think tanks and analytical organizations um, about their visions. Um, so the first panel, to turn, turn attention to the topic we have at hand. Data and measurements are very important for all sectors, but especially coal mine. Um, the reason is mitigation in the coal mining sector happens through project development. And project development requires solid data, frequent data, regular data, that you need to prove to investors, as we heard um, Guy talk about yesterday um, and his interactions with, with investors. So with that in mind, um, I, will, I will introduce the panel today. Uh, very distinguished speakers. We will hear from Clark Talkington of Advanced Resources International. He will provide um, an overview of the guidance report we, pre we prepared for um, measurement reporting and verification systems and sort of like to help countries develop the MRV systems. Uh, the next speaker will be Osgan Karasan um, from USGS on um, analysis of geology and methane control systems, followed by Jean-Francois Gauthier from GHG SAT, how to make an impact on methane uh, mitigation. And finally, by Riley Duran at Cover Mapper, who will talk about challenges and advances in monitoring and quantification using remote sensing methods. So I will ask you to hold your questions until the very end, and hopefully we'll have time for discussion. So with that, um, I will turn the first uh, to the first speaker, uh, Clark Talkington, who is the Vice President at Advanced Resources International uh, for the last 21 years. Um, he's been at IRI, but also in other organizations where he focused on energy development and greenhouse gas uh, mitigation in the United States as well as internationally. Um, his principal areas are methane reductions in the oil and gas and coal sectors, um, as well as advancement of carbon capture, utilization and storage and smart grid and city smart cities development. Um, so Clark, please take it away. Uh, th thank you very much, Roya. Um, Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to introduce um, a report that was uh, prepared by the UN Economic Commission for Europe, a uh, group of experts on coal mine methane and uh, the Global Methane Initiative um, Coal Subcommittee. Um, and the purpose of that, is, as Volley indicated, um, is to look at monitoring, reporting, verification in the, in the coal sector. Um, previously, actually, um, these organizations also had, had supported development of a similar document for the, the oil and gas sector. Um, and, you know, we've talked on, uh, about a number of barriers um, over the last few days, uh, specifically in the coal sector, uh, toward, you know, uh, you know, additional methane mitigation. Um, everything from technology to funding, et cetera. Um, but clearly, uh, reliable data and extensive data is a serious hole that, that we need to address to better understand, you know, what the emissions are globally, um, as well as what the emission reduction potential is. And then ultimately, um, you know, basically being able to confirm any type of emission reductions we make. Um, and worldwide, I mean, we see quite a, a variation in terms of how uh, emissions are measured in the mining sector. Um, I would say, you know, largely uh, emission factors are heavily utilized. Um, sometimes this is based on uh, very old data, um, and, and so we're not really sure if these emission factors are even really relevant anymore. Um, some countries, however, do measure emissions, um, both, you know, at the ventilation shaft as well as um, from gas drainage, um, and also obviously measure any type of uh, emission reduction activity. So um, the UNEC and GMI um, decided to put together this best practice guidance series. This is actually, I think, the third in the, in the best practice uh, coal mine methane best practice guidance series that the UNEC is supported um, with the idea of trying to to 
provide some overall guidance to policymakers and other stakeholders um, with respect to this issue. So we know that coal mines release, you know, we've talked about this, roughly around 10% of, of global methane emissions, anthropogenic methane emissions. Um, and we also know that monitoring, reporting, and verification plans, um, you know, if, if they're structured appropriately, can provide robust data that really help us um, in, in many respects. Um, and, uh, you know, these, pro, you know, we'll, we'll go in, into more detail, but roughly when we talk about, you know, uh, the M and MRV uh, monitoring is <clears throat> what we're really talking about is monitoring and measurement, um, reporting or reporting systems, as well as uh, reported data. And then verification is, is a critical element because, you know, you're having, uh, you know, you, you need some type of verification mechanism to, to ensure the data, you know, are accurate. Um, we published this report. It's actually freely available, I think, in English, French, and Russian at this point um, on the UNEC website. Uh, and you can access it through both the UNEC and GMI uh, web pages. Um, it's probably roughly about 80 pages. Um, we, it was quite an extensive process. We had a, um, a drafting team um, and we had a, a technical review uh, a team, uh, including Oskin was one of our technical reviewers. And then we had multiple contributors, um, you know, from different organizations. Um, and so pretty much everyone, basically everyone on this group had, has had experience uh, in, in, the, in, in coal mine methane MRV. So this just gives you a quick uh, outline of, of what the table of contents looks like. Um, you know, we look at sources of coal mine methane, and then we go into more specific uh, review of monitoring, reporting, and verification of methane emissions, the, the, the options available, um, everything from emission factors through uh, in, bo in bottom up approaches, emission factors, me you know, uh, measurement methods for both ventilation and gas drainage. Um, as well as abandoned mine and surface mine methane. Uh, and then we also look at, at top-down approaches, so uh, remote sensing aircraft as well as satellite. Um, and, uh, and then we, uh, we, we, we discussed really, I mean, at the end of the day, the goal is not only to understand, you know, uh, better understand emissions, but, you know, how can this help us mitigate these emissions? And, and so we try to tie it to that. Um, and then we provide some examples of different uh, MRV programs around the world, um, Australia, the US, and, and some other countries. Um, and then finally, we just, we kind of have a, um, you know, a fairly extensive, um, it's really in table format, um, but we just try to provide, you know, a, a list of considerations for policymakers as they, they, they consider, uh, M, you know, developing MRV programs or refining MRV programs and, you know, what to think about um, and, and what, you know, how to, you know, what to consider in terms of uh, structuring. And, you know, basically it's, it's kind of based on a collective, experience of, of everyone who contributed to the document. So I'm just going to try to quickly go through this. Um, so as, as we know, um, you know, MRV programs, uh, we, we, you know, they obviously support um, the national inventories and, and, and uh, communications and other documentation to the UNFCCC. Um, but they also help us understand emissions uh, to develop, you know, for policymaking and to guide policymaking. Um, I think in the oil and gas sector, for those of you, if anybody that's gone to any of the oil and gas sector sessions, you know, you, you know, you've probably heard quite a bit about the U.S. methane fee and uh, for the oil and gas sector. And really the greenhouse gas reporting program here has, um, that's really driven a, a lot of the analysis that has gone into the development of that fee. Um, it also helps us again, you know, uh, track mitigation and, and support it and, and understand the impact. Um, and it, as Volya said, it, I mean, it's critical, frankly, to investing in mitigation projects. You know, someone who worked at a, you know, for an investor and a project developer for a number of years, I mean, um, you really can't put together a project and design a project and obtain financing for that project um, without you know, robust and reliable data. Um, so uh, this just very quickly, I mean, you've probably seen all this. I'm not going to spend a lot, you know, much time on this, but it's really just intended to, you know, show you the various, you know, uh, when we talk about mine methane, we're talking about um, surface mine methane, uh, mostly underground, working underground mine methane, 
but also, you know, when mines close, we we have abandoned mine methane, and mines have been known to, uh, you know, gas has has been known to desorb um, into the the old workings for up to a hundred years. So, um, it it uh, especially as mines close, it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, so some of the things we do know uh, with respect to mine methane is that C methane concentrations and flows are inherently variable. Um, and, you know, basically we have to design systems to account for this. Um, the emissions and methane, uh, the methane emissions in coal mines are also generally tied to the extraction of coal. So the more rapid, uh, you know, the more rapid and extensive coal production, you know, it, not always, but that can you know generally translate to increased methane emissions. Um, so there's other factors obviously involved, um, including especially geology uh, and and um, you know so, some other factors that can either increase or decrease uh, the flow of methane. Um, and then finally, um, when again when methane ceases, we know that um, it, as long as the mine doesn't flood. Um, we will continue to at least see methane emitted into the old workings. Um, so the, these just give you a sense of these, these were actually measurements, um, actual measurements taken off uh, at a mine in China, um, a project I worked on a number of years ago. Um, so on your left are, you know, this shows you the variability in, in gas drainage emissions. These, are, these were actually measured emissions using continuous monitoring. Uh, so you can see, I mean, it's it, uh, you know, the concentration can go up and down, the flow rates can go up and down, and uh, with respect to gas drainage. On your right um, is uh, actually uh, continuous monitoring measurements taken at a ventilation shaft, um, and we did this actually in preparation. Both of these were in preparation for methane mitigation projects. The drainage project on the left was for uh, power production and a flaring. And uh, the ventilation project on the right was for ventilation or methane uh, project. Um, and so we, 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 we had a company that consisted of a lot of mining engineers, so uh, ventilation engineers. Uh, they really wanted to be sure that the, you know, they had a good, hand, uh, good understanding of what uh, the ventilation measurements were uh, in the ventilation flows and fluctuations so they, you know, that we wouldn't either under design or over design the system. Um, I think we took measurements every five or 15 minutes. So the chart on your right actually shows what that looks like. So in the course of the day, I think our average methane concentration over three years was roughly about 0.6%. But in the course of a day, it could go, you know, 0.5 up to 0.7%, you know, just depending on what was occurring underground, if they were in a production mode, you know, or if they were change of shift or, or what have you. Um, I mean, the flow, it's the airflow itself and, uh, you know, generally, you know, your the, the fan flow is going to stay uh, generally similar, but the, the methane concentration can go up and down. So um, I already kind of described these terms. I, I won't go into detail. The, the document is probably about 80 pages and we're trying to, and, and actually we're in the process of developing uh, with Tetra Tech and EPA. Uh, kind of a condensed, more user-friendly visual type um, uh, document that would will, will be available soon. Um, but again, you're really, you know, monitoring, we're really talking about measurement ideally. Um, but if measurement's not, you know, available, then, um, you know, if we have to use emission factors, you know, that's that's a possibility, especially for potentially surface mines, uh, depending on how, you know, how we advance remote sensing. Uh, reporting means, you know, again, the structure, the framework, um, even the regulatory requirements um, for reporting uh, the data, you know, how do you do that? What format do you do that in? Um, even down to the reporting forms. And then really the, the data itself and providing that data um, to the public or whomever uses it, policyholders, et cetera. Um, and then verification, uh, whether that verification is self-verification, whether it's third party, there needs to be some type of mechanism uh, to basically Q, you know, QC the data. Um, so if we look at the different sources, I mean, this is just my my uh, perspective, and I guess the perspective probably we all echoed in the the document, um, and that is when you're looking at underground mines, um, 
there's really, you know, it's there's there's pretty clear point sources. I mean, those point sources are either ventilation shafts or gas drainage wells. Um, I guess potentially outcrops are possible, but uh, on a working mine, I mean, most uh, most everything's under some type of pressure, positive or negative pressure. Um, and so the me you know, it, actually measuring those emissions um, can be readily measurable and qu quantifiable. And this is one reason in the Kyoto days, um, coal mine methane projects were considered among the highest quality projects um, just because they were very large projects. Mitigation potential was significant. I mean, we have projects in, for instance, in the U.S. where you can get, you know, uh, they're they're reducing, you know, they're, produ you know, I mean, they can produce, you know, million, uh, reduce a million tons a year, CO2 equivalent, that type of thing. Um, abandoned mines, uh, well, and I, I would also say for the, the gas drainage as well, uh, usually gas drainage, um, there's usually some type of um, definite continuous monitoring, whether it's being recorded by uh, equipment or better. <laughs> We've actually seen a si situations in China where somebody just sits there at the flow meter taking, you know, writing down methane concentrations and flow rates at the, the drainage station. Uh, abandoned mines, uh, really you have vents um, at sealed mines that, are, that can be measured, um, but otherwise um, emissions from uh, abandoned mines are typically out of um, uh, outcrops. And, and so if you know where those outcrops are, you can probably go out and measure them, may not be always efficient to do so. Uh, surface mines, uh, historically we've always used emission factors, but as you'll hear, um, and there's been a lot of, and I assume you'll hear, um, and there's been a lot of information, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, quite some quite famous cases in, uh, over the last year or two of satellite measurements and some of the potential emissions being reported uh, for some surface mines that are, you know, at least uh, reportedly far above what were previously uh, expected. So these are just some quick pictures of, of you know, just to give you a sense of <clears throat> what you know, what measurement uh, capabilities are out there. Uh, well, the top one was just a pressure gauge, actually, at uh, a mine in China. I didn't actually have a photo of the methane uh, sensor and, and flow meter, uh, but they usually, they have that equipment usually on the pipes. In China, a lot of times, it's, it, there's actually somebody sitting there taking the measurements, but uh, more modern, you know, in other countries, you have recording flow meters. Uh, this, uh, the second one is actually continuous emissions monitor on a, a vent shaft uh, in Australia, uh, Anglo, actually Anglo coal. Um, and then the third is just a, a measurement being taken a vent pipe at an abandoned mine in the UK. Um, so, you know, today if we look at, at best practices, um, really we're, you know, for working underground mines, the, the current best practices we have are you know, there there are examples of continuous emissions monitoring in certain countries, uh, especially on gas drainage and destruction or utilization. Um, part of that, especially destruction utilization, is because you really have to. I mean, it's it's how you make the equipment operate. Um, you know, we we see that both in Australia and the United States, for example. Um, and these these emissions uh, are are reported. Um, so. Uh, in the U.S., we actually allow for we, we actually allow for ventilation and gas drainage, um, continuous monitoring, or use of uh, periodic sampling. Um, and then for uh, underground mines, uh, typically, uh, you know, there there are ideally some measurements taken, and then but but methane uh, emissions are usually based on a decline curve analysis or statistical analysis. Uh, again, surface mines, we're, we're looking predominantly at, at emission factors, so I'm really interested to hear about the satellites. Uh, Post-mining emissions, it's, it's, which is basically processing storage, uh, we're really just looking at um, emission factors unless somebody comes up with a better option here. <laughs> it's cost effective. Um, so the reporting requirements, I mean, this has become a big issue. Um, so the, the idea really, uh, you know, some people want everything reported. Others want only, uh, I guess, what you might call emissions of consequence reported. But, you know, ideally, you're trying to balance the measurement and reporting burden on the reporter, you know, with the the value of the data 
and and the the work it's going to take uh, to report uh, to measure, report, verify uh, the data, and publish the data. Um, so I think um, probably what we're seeing and and uh, globally uh, with recognition of you know methane emissions um, you know is uh, growing in importance uh, is is this this needle is definitely shifting to. Uh, much more rigor on the part of, you know, MRV and, you know, more frequent sampling, more fr more frequent, you know, measurement, more detailed, more granular reporting. Um, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for EPA, but I'm assuming that for, for instance, for the methane fee, the level of granularity and reporting is going to have to be significant, both for, you know, the industry and for the public, you know, because both are going to want to, when you're paying a fee, um, you're going to want to to make sure that data is accurate as possible. Um, in terms of verification, there's a range of ver verification methods. Um, you know, for instance, Australia requires third-party verification in their reporting program. The U.S. uses a self-certification, and then EPA actually does a verification. So it, it can range. Uh, but again, the idea is that there is you know credibility to the to the data. Um, so I guess in summary, I would say that, you know, as, you know, as we look, um, you know, to the, to really refine our MRV programs and the coal sector, um, and you, you know, policymakers are moving forward with these, you know, obviously you have to develop a policy framework that's consistent with your statutory, cultural, legis you know, legal processes, um, and 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 it may differ among countries. You know, it may not be consistent across all countries. Um, you know, the uh, uh, so it's critical also that you define you know the stakeholders, who they are, what their role, specific role is, and you know, uh, and I would just say the public is always a critical stakeholder. So <laughs> because in the end of the day, that's that's who we're doing this for, right? Um, you know, you, you have to understand the sources of emissions, where are the emissions, the magnitude, the relative magnitude of the emissions, um, and then look at the feasibility of direct measurement. Um, is that is it really feasible in every case? Uh, or, you know, I think like one of the EU proposals is is to go measure, and I could be wrong, I'm, I'm not an expert on the EU at all, but I think one of the discussions was actually going out and measuring all the abandoned mines, and I'm, I'm not, personally, I'm not sure that's actually feasible, you know. Um, or cost effective, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, one, one of the things you, you may have to look at as well is looking at reporting thresholds. So I, you know, in the coal sector, it's a bit easier just because um, there's only so many mines um, and, you know, frankly, not all of them are gassy, right? Not every mine is gassy. So uh, in what we're, what we usually find is that a majority, of, there's a, a limited number of mines that account for most emissions. So maybe you tie it, you know, in order to play, in, in order to avoid a burden on everybody, you limit that burden, you know, reporting burden to those facilities. So, and ultimately you have to develop some type of programs, you know, program structure for the, uh, you know, how you measure, how you report, how you verify. So, you know, our goal, our ultimate goal is really to, again, to get to a point where we have accurate, robust data um, that really helps us uh, move toward mitigation of these emissions. Uh, so I just want to thank you guys um, and uh, available for any questions after we after uh, the panel finishes and uh, thanks. Um, thank you, Clark, for this overview. I think about a third of you was uh, were involved in um, review editing of the report, but for the other uh, two thirds, I uh, hope you know this resource is available. Um, Next, I'll introduce Dr. Osgan Karasan, um, who's standing right here behind me, uh, who is a research petroleum engineer with the Geology, Energy and Mineral Science Center at USGS um, in Western Virginia. Before joining USGS in 2017, Osgan worked for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, um, as a senior engineer for 13 years, where he managed research projects related to ventilation and methane control in coal mines. He received NIOSH Alice Hamilton Awards in 2013 and 2016. Uh, he presented and published extensively in Reservoir and Formation 
analysis, modeling, origins of CMM and AMM emissions, and their capture and control. Please um, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Valia. Uh, thank you, Clark, for this excellent presentation because it's going to make my life easier. My first two slides are related to uh, MRV uh, and why it's important for uh, in the context of coal mines. But well, I mean, I came up with this title because I'm going to analyze the geology and then I'm going to look at how methane control system interacts with the geology to reduce emissions. Because, you know, as we have heard from the presentations uh, yesterday and the day before, the ultimate goal, at least to my view, since I worked for NIOSH for 13 years, of course, safety should be one of the important components of what we are doing with coal mine methane. Uh, so, the more we capture underground, the less emissions there's going to be. And uh, and the better data that we have, the, the better predictive capabilities or monitoring capabilities that we have, then there is going to be investment towards the towards that project or, or or towards that mine. So so those are the things that I will try to emphasize by, by walking through you uh, bottom-up approach that I applied to mine in the US. But for the, uh, well, this, I already mentioned this, and just a couple of uh, remarks, if you can bear with me. I mean, we know why methane is important. Uh, it's it's a potent global warming, well, potent greenhouse gas, and actually it's more potent than CO2 um, in a time, uh, 100 time, a year time frame. Uh, and according to the latest UNEP uh, report on global assessment of methane, actually 50% of the global methane emissions are from human activity and fossil fuels constitute about 35%. And coal mining by itself is about 10 to 12% of those uh, emissions. And of course, there are variabilities based on countries because, it, you know, the geology changes, uh, coal seams change and the type of mine they operate, they change. So. So the, there are variability in emissions in different countries. Uh, MRV, why is it important? Clark already mentioned uh, in his uh, excellent presentation, but just to say a few things about why facility level data are important. Uh, facility level data are special temporally better results with lower uncertainty. And can, and can capture the heterogeneities or, or the differences in, in emissions due to different factors like operations and et cetera. So, so if we have facility level data, then we are going to have better data actually uh, to invest towards mitigation uh, projects. And if we can combine geological understanding, what we are going to monitor uh, either by using underground measurements or top-down measurements, then we are going to improve our understanding of the source of emissions and we can better predict them. And then again, it's going to support the mitigation efforts. In As in every project, incomplete knowledge, knowledge, I mean, incomplete knowledge, as one of my senior colleagues, Ricardo Olea, mentioned to me some time ago, actually, um, it's not a property of the system, right? I mean, the, everything there is to know that's in there, but it's our knowledge that we are lacking. So if we can improve our understanding of the system and complete our data set by using different approaches, then, then we have a better estimate. Uh, as for the MRV, uh, currently uh, they mostly rely on measurements uh, at facility and facility level process based modeling and those are bottom up bottom up approaches. Of course, there are some emerging methods like top down um, uh, measurements using remote sensing methods and satellites that the other speakers are going to talk about. Uh, also, if I'm not uh, mistaken, they are not widely used currently in official reporting. So, so maybe there should be a reconciliation process between top-down and bottom-up approaches to approach them uh, or, uh, together. Um, so, so th the main purpose of this presentation after this long introduction actually is to analyze the geology and general methane control measures for estimation of emissions. And, and also the study, study the gasification system of a coal mine, 
uh, in the US. I mean, some of you are already going to recognize this coal mine. I'm not going to mention the name. I would like to keep them anonymous anyway, but uh, well, it's in the Central Appalachian Basin. It's in the <laughs> Buchanan County. So, <laughs> so OK, one million dollar question, which mines? Right, so anyway. Uh, uh, so the south southwestern Virginia, uh, it's in the Oakwood uh, CVM field here, and the mine is located here. And a mine actually completed this section already, and now they are mining the northern area, but they are planning to expand towards the southern and uh, southern uh, reserve section. Uh, when we were talking with the mine, actually, I mean, there, there were a couple of concerns. We didn't really study this work to for mitigation purposes, right? I mean, the issue was that there were some emission problems in the mine, and the question was how we can address those. But of course, it, it ties back to mitigation too, because, you know, as you are going to see, there are a lot of uh, methane emissions from the mine. And well, East Main District panels, those are, uh, they, they have been mined between 2001 and 2021. It took about 20 years. Um, and this, uh, the last four panels that we studied, uh, that was our focus area because of the excessive emissions that were reported and that slowed down the operation of the mine, were mined between 2019 and 2021. Initially, when they started mining from the 1R panel, the panel width was about 900 feet, but then successively they reduced to 700 feet. I think it was a wise choice to do that. And the panel lengths were 1100 feet following the reserve um, or the resources actually. Uh, and then they, they decreased it to uh, 5500 feet coming to, towards the uh, 31R panel at the end. Uh, and uh, between 2000, uh, 2001 and 2021, the average phase advance rate was 30, between, varied between 30 and 110 feet beats per day. So, I mean, for this mine, making this much of gas, actually, this is a very good uh, mining operation. And, and this operation is quite honestly, it's impressive, really. I mean, they are doing everything they can to reduce their emissions, but it's the geology. It's, it's very complicated and there are gas coal seams. And what are those? Well, they are mining here on Pocantas number three coal bed. And there, it's a Pennsylvanian system. It's part of the Pocantos formation. But when you go up, actually, you are going to have a series of po different Pocantos calls. And there is this basal lead sandstone between Pocantos number six and seven. And the gas emission zone that we predicted, it goes up to about lower sea seaboard falls in there. So it's about uh, 700 feet or so. However, you know, when you look at this overburden and the width of the panels, actually the overburden is much larger than the width of the panels. So it's quite different than the Northern Appalachian Basin coal beds or, or, or the mines, because this is a, sub, a subcritical panel. So, the, so it bends, basically. The formation bends. It, they don't crumble and cave down. The initial caving is in terms of large blocks. And when you come to basal, uh, Lee sandstone, of course, it's about 100, 150 feet thick, so it doesn't really break. But you know, the the the, the, the strains and stresses are trans transferred across, and the coal beds bent. So the production uh, comes from those coal beds that are bent because you know the strata separations occur between formations that are or when, when there is. The, the too much uh, uh, strength difference, compressive strength difference. So those are the sandstones and coal beds, right? So it goes up to about lower uh, seaboard uh, coal bed there. And not only that, you know, considering this many coal beds, currently they are mining in a in the Pocantas number three. It splits. You know, there is an upper split and lower split. 
So they mine uh, it together with the separating partings, but they mine it up to two feet thick. So if it's uh, if the coal bed if or or the, if the parting is more than two feet, they don't mine it, right? So so there is this interval that's the source of the phase gas. Uh, let's have a look at the methane control system in general. They have a large capacity ventilation shaft, fractured vertical degasification wells. They are in the uh, they are in the uh, Oakwood CBM field. So CBM field actually was um, permitted for 80 feet spacing or 80 acre spacing. I'm sorry. However, later it was reduced to 40, but now it's close to 20 or something or in that in that order. Right? Please correct me when I'm when I'm wrong. Right. Um, um, and the gap gas boreholes, they have many of them because they have a very gas strata and they would like to pull the gas. And uh, as our colleague from CNX, when he was presenting yesterday, the quality of gas is high, so it's pipeline quality gas. It's it's very similar to Black Warrior Basin. Actually, when you go to uh, which, which used to be Jim Walters, now it is Warrior Meth Coal. Uh, the, the gas is produced through the same or very similar type of caving process from Pratt Seam, and they produce 99% methane there. So it's the same thing here. So Black Warrior Basin is actual extension of the central Appalachian Basin anyway. And there are fractured wells, I said, gap gas boreholes, and there are horizontal inseam boreholes. There are 50 or 60 of them drilled from the tailgate in every panel. Uh, fractured boreholes, they are fractured at uh, four or five different stages, targeting different coal beds. Uh, they are operated four to six years in advance uh, of, in general, mining. Uh, I'm just trying to select what I should say in order not to take too much time, but and there were 30 wells in, in total in that area. In seam boreholes, 40, 50 are drilled from the tailgate. The lead time before mining is eight to 12 months. Um, but there may be additional two to three months because you know they progressively terminate them. Top gas boreholes, they are drilled to a depth of 40 feet above the top of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, as I worked with Pittsburgh Coalition too, for too long, so I, I keep saying Pittsburgh. But um, 900 feet open all section, and that that covers majority of the. Pocantas formation and the new river formation there. So those are the number of gap, gap gas boreholes. It's just too many. Um, and the ventilation shaft is about 400,000 CFM. Face ventilation is about 90,000 CFM or so. And the, those are the pressure and, and flow changes in the ventilation, but but how, but but look at the, the 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 methane flow actually methane percentage. It's it's in the order of you know 1.5 percent. Sometimes goes up to two percent. Sometimes comes down and etc. So there is a base load in this ventilation system of about 0.75 percent methane, just because of other ventilated areas. But you know when they are mining you know, the, the percentage jumps to different levels. So this is the uh, this is the ventilation shaft methane the quantity, gap gas flow, uh, daily coal production and long goal phase advance plotted in the same graph. And as you can see, actually, all the production correlates with the coal production. So when there isn't any coal production, there is a base load of ventilation from the ventilation system, which is about 500 million, I'm sorry, 5 million cubic feet a day. But you know, when you are mining, it goes up to eight to 10 and et cetera. Okay, so this is a visual view of 
what we have just talked about. This is the fracture borehole. This is the gulf gas borehole. And these are the, these are the horizontal borehole. This is the width of the panel. However, when you are talking about caving and long wall and etc., your gas emission zone is actually much larger than the uh, much larger than your panel panel width. And this is the gas that you are dealing with, that you are trying to mitigate or control underground and etc. Okay, so what was the general approach? Well, of course, we studied the, the geology and potential emission sources. Uh, look at the gap size and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then for the uh, for the fractured wells, we perform the decline curve analysis of all the wells to estimate the EUR at a very low low rate. So what does it give us? Because we don't know what the what the gas in place is. That's what we need, right, to start with. How it's it's the same concept. For example, in oil. Well, if you extend the, 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 the production to very low levels, theoretically you are at the residual oil saturation, that oil saturation that you cannot really move anymore. So if you apply the same concept here, you are at the residual gas. So you assume that you produce all the gas that can be desorbed, but you are at the residual gas, right? So it gives, kind of gives you a gas in place estimate. If you do it for the 30 wells, you are ba basically covering that entire area that you are interested in. OK, uh, and then you have point wise data. You would like to know what the gas in place for the coal beds that actually the mining horizon is with those partings and splits and etc. So I did just statistical modeling for this purpose. So you have point wise data, you know, thickness, ash, uh, gas content, you know, BTU and etc. So I calculated did the geostatistical simulation for thickness, density and ash and BTU, right? And then of course I needed the gas content to use them in the gas vol volumetric gas uh, equation. I didn't have enough data to do the same thing for the gas content data, so I co-simulated uh, gas content with the BTU because they correlate usually. If you have a higher BTU call, it has a higher gas content because of the maturity and the and the reduced ash and etc. So, uh, so that that was the uh, that was the call part, but I have partings as well. So I used the sequential indicator simulation for that, just to just to just to find the areas where the mine actually mines that less than two feet section. So when you add up, uh, overlay everything or superimpose, you are going to end up with those maps, right? So those are the gas in place for. For contest number three, just for the main bench, this is the gas content for the for the interval less than two feet thickness for the splits, and this is the interval more than two feet splits. So, so when you are mining, actually, you are getting your gas from on the face from here and here. However, at least for this part that we're interested. In, but but look at this one, right? So that was one of the reasons that the, that the 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 mine came to us. You know, the long wall disturbs surroundings too. So so if you have gas source like this affected from the mining, it's 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 going to flow into into the mine because the mine is in negative pressure anyway. So. So that's obviously one of the one of the most likely possibilities that where the gas was coming coming to mine. So the next question was, OK, I mean, what can we do to 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 control the gas, right? Uh, because as I said, control of the gas underground is going to lead to or, or minimize the emissions to the, to, to the atmosphere. Um, so. But first, we need to uh, validate 
our approach or way of thinking. So, so by using all this, I'm sorry, by using all these concepts, I, I, I cannot give all the details here right now, but but we calculated uh, gas in place after the gasification for the GAP gas, source of the GAP gas for each panel, and also for the phase or the or for the mine. So, uh, so, so for this, for example, 28R panel had about 1 billion, uh, I'm sorry, 1, 1 million cubic feet of gas per acre when it's mined. And the last panel was 2.3 million cubic feet of gas when it's mined. So, so it kind of explains, uh, you know, why there were gas issues because the, the, the gasification was not efficient. So the, the, our colleagues at the mine, they were very helpful, by the way. I mean, I, I cannot thank them enough. They said, OK, you know, what can we do, right? So by using these numbers, I, I told them, OK, just be, these numbers are based on per acre of mining. So if you use the, the if you use the face advanced data, actually you should be able to match the observed or monitored emissions. And here are the results for those. Those are the gap by using just the phase advance rate. This is the match obtained uh, for the gap gas production. And this is the match obtained for the phase emissions. OK, three minutes and I'm going to be done in three minutes. OK, so the scenarios. Well, there are two options, obviously. One of them is what are the best tools that you have? You have uh, lateral boreholes and and the vertical boreholes, so you can extend the production duration of the vertical boreholes. Or let's say, if you increase it by two years or four years, you decrease your MMSCF per acre compared to the original case, and also the the gas availability in P3 and it, it splits, and 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 the reduction if you increase the production by two years somehow if you extend it because sometimes mine plans do not really match up with the production but but in any case you obtain this much of uh, decrease in gas production and but more importantly your face emissions are going to decrease almost 30 percent. If you do it four years, obviously you expect more reductions. For the lateral, then we calculated what the, how many laterals should be drilled or what the spacing should be. So, so if you are, for example, looking into 60, uh, 60 million cubic feet in the P3 seam to when you are mining, then you need to drill uh, this many wells. And the spacing should be this much. If you are reduced, if you are looking into reducing even more, then you will need to increase the number of wells in each of the panels, and they are the corresponding MMSCF per acre. And the spacing should be this one. And the reduction that you are going to get underground is going to be about 50% less. Okay, so the conclusions are MRV of the Mine emissions at facility level, when possible, is important. Obviously, I just mentioned that. The present work showed that bottom-up me methods of monitoring emissions through combining geological understanding actually and, and maintain the gasification performance uh, can provide reliable estimates. And also, uh, such an approach can develop can help developing strategies to reduce emissions from ventilation system and gas accumulation potential in the gut that can be a problem later on. Of course, beyond, beyond climate targets, targets, this is important to improve the safety, which should be our first goal. And and my last remark uh, is that. Top-down methods can certainly be complementary to bottom-up methods uh, because there are inherent uncertainties in both of them, and they sh they can be a really good complementary tool to each other after a reconciliation process. So, yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Osgan. I think it's it's rare that we get um, our hands on such detailed explanation and all the complexities that are involved in methane monitoring and control um, on the ground. So that was definitely um, much appreciated. Uh, the next speaker is Jean-Francois Gauthier. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer and a lifelong space geek. That's how he described himself. Uh, with over 15 years of experience in the commercial space industry in various cap capacities at ComDev, including design and text and test, uh, project management and sales and marketing. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering from Delahue's University and an MBA from Wilfrid Lawyer, uh, Lawyer University. He's also a graduate of the International Space University's Summer Session Program. Uh, in October 2016, he joined GHG SAT to help commercialize the products and services from the breakthrough, uh, breakthrough satellites around the world. He now leads the growing sales and marketing team at GHG SAT. Please welcome. Right here. All right, here we are. So um, it's almost like well, yeah, uh, planned this. Uh, have uh, myself and Riley presenting after these these two gentlemen talking about MRV. So uh, and uh, Osgin's last line here about the complementarity of. Uh, top-down measurements and how it can help with MRV uh, is uh, even more relevant. I think what uh, I'll be introducing you to here um, should be should be quite interesting in that context. So, uh, so first, uh, many of you might not be might not be familiar with uh, with JC sets. So I'll give you a quick context and then uh, dive into some uh, some relevant examples here. So. So JC side is a uh, a company that measures emissions, methane emissions directly from industrial facilities around the world using our own satellites. So we currently have six satellites in orbit. We're launching six more next year, and we have our eye on launching uh, over uh, up to 100 by the end of 2026. So. Um, this. So some of the uh, so what makes us a little bit unique here uh, currently? is that we measure these emissions at a uh, resolution that's sufficient to go down to the facility level. So methane emissions have been, at least actually greenhouse gases have been measured by satellites for a long time, uh, but typically it's been done by uh, what we call global mappers. So they look at regional and global concentrations. We're able to go down directly to the facility and you'll see that in some of the examples. I'll give you, we do that at 25 meter resolution. Uh, our images are 12 by 12 kilometers, so we can um, we can monitor multiple sources in, in that in that image and differentiate between them because of that uh, because of that high resolution. And uh, so uh, we've been uh, at this uh, since 2016. Our first satellite was launched in 2016. And we, uh, of course, perform a lot of validation uh, a lot of uh, testing to prove uh, the validity of our results and how they they correlate. So, uh, and one of these activities that we've undertaken is uh, to go through the evaluation process from the European Space Agency to become a third party mission. We achieved that status uh, last uh, a few months ago, actually. Uh, but also we perform a lot of testing um, by ourselves with industrial partners and with uh, 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 academics um, and we uh, most of these um, studies include controlled releases. Many of them are blind, like in this case here. So there's a there's a particular paper here that's under review that's been submitted by uh, Adam Brandt's team at Stanford, which looked at all of the satellites uh, that are currently available to uh, to monitor uh, methane emissions. So. Um, You'll see that uh, our um, our our performance here uh, is uh, significant in, in two respects. So you can see that we're the only system that's able to monitor below a thousand uh, kilograms per hour, well below in the in the low hundreds, and also that our estimates are very close to the line. So uh, in, in this particular test, we perform quite well, and we're very keen to continue doing these to validate the performance in, in various environmental conditions in a variety of different terrains as well. So we'll go into uh, into coal uh, because that's what we're here for. I mean, JCSAT measures emissions from oil and gas. 
uh, from waste management uh, and of course from coal and even from from agriculture but here we'll focus on on uh, on emissions from coal mines so these are some examples here of a pretty a pretty good cross section of some of the emissions we saw in the last year uh, with our satellites so you can see the different colors that might be a little bit uh, a little bit difficult uh, to see from a distance but there are different colors on here and blue indicates the the coal mining uh, the coal mining emissions that we've seen so we've seen them all over the world uh, in Australia in China uh, in the US uh, in uh, in Europe etc so we see them we see them everywhere um, a lot of these sources we monitor on a on a very regular basis and we're accumulating a, uh, a very significant body of of, uh, of of work of measurements to to see how they uh, how they might evolve over time and under different conditions so uh, here uh, this is to highlight that um, our early work was uh, particularly with underground mines because of the um, very concentrated nature of the emissions. So it's been mentioned here about the ventilation shafts and, and uh, how they uh, evacuate the, the methane to the surface. So these are very, very strong point sources. They're easy to see. They're some of the largest sources in the world and many of them are persistent. So some of these that we see in, uh, in China, for example, uh, um, in Russia, and, uh, and in Australia are, would fall in that category. That particular one here is in Kazakhstan on, uh, on your left. But in the last uh, 18 months or so, we've made significant progress in being able to measure emissions from open pit mines. And that's an area that's uh, perhaps less documented, that's uh, also more challenging. It's obviously more diffuse. It's over a larger area, but, uh, but we've had significant success recently in uh, in obtaining results over uh, over open pit mines, this particular one is in uh, is in Australia. So uh, a quick note here: uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, the fact that with six satellites in orbit, we're able to start monitoring facilities repeatedly. So we're able to start getting an idea on mine activities and its impact on the emissions, and also on seasonalities, because of course mines uh, might. Uh, uh, the emissions might behave differently over over the different seasons, also because this could affect the uh, uh, the, the the activities of the mine. But um, here, I'm, I'm, you could see emissions from a uh, from a mine uh, mining area in Poland over one day. So there were several emissions, several shafts that were uh, that were emitting. But if I if I add uh, several days of this, you can start seeing now. Uh, what what this means? You can start seeing different plumes appearing, uh, traveling in different directions because of wind uh, wind direction. But um, over time, you start accumulating uh, uh, accumulating a a data set that becomes very useful in determining first of all are these how, how persistent are they, um, how stable are they, are they are they varying uh, significantly? And now you can start thinking about correlating that with some of the some of the data that's been presented earlier today. So um, it's important to mention that uh, satellites are one part of the of the puzzle here. Um, we're never going to pretend that they are the only tool to help in this. They are one uh, very useful technology to do this. But of course, there's uh, aircraft sensors, drones, and various other technologies that uh, all combined together can start providing a much uh, a much better picture as to uh, what the emissions look like over. Uh, over the uh, you know over time, and uh, another uh, another way that um, um, persistence can be can be useful is in the detection of an anomalous condition. So, this particular mine here in Russia, um, uh, in uh, in January we detected very very high emissions. So, on that particular day we saw uh, thirteen plumes that um, that equated to about 95, uh, 95 tons of methane per hour. So for this particular mine, it was highly unusual. So we've seen uh, over time emissions on a very regular basis at this mine, but never to that, uh, to that magnitude. This was uh, about two to three times, sometimes four times higher than, uh, than the typical uh, you know, nominal operating conditions. So uh, we, uh, we did 
uh, contact the uh, the operator to see if we could uh, if we could uh, gain some insight and help them in, in understanding what happened. Uh, that was not as fruitful as we would have liked, uh, but uh, but it still illustrates um, the usefulness of this uh, of this kind of uh, information. So one thing that's really, and I and I alluded to that a second ago. I mentioned other technologies uh, that can collaborate together, but different satellite systems can collaborate together as well. Um, those global mappers that I mentioned earlier, uh, the ones that uh, like Tropomi, like Sentinel Five P from the European Space Agency, for example, look at emissions at a much coarser resolution. So what you see on on the left here is a is a Tropomi image of a mine in China. But what you can, every little square that you see in there is seven kilometers by seven kilometers. So it becomes impossible to really determine, you know, is it really the coal mine? Is it something else that's adjacent to it? Uh, and um, when you combine that with, uh, with high resolution imagery, because now we can train our satellites to go look at these hotspots and identify exactly where the source is, now you start getting a much better picture. And so not only can you confirm it's the mine, but you could say, it's shaft number seven, um, so you you get a you get a much better idea, and uh, and then when it's uh, when it comes down to trying to uh, to resolve with um, with estimates or or uh, or measurements made on the ground, you can get a much better uh, a much better correlation. So, and I mentioned, um, you know, in those other technologies that there's there's aircraft sensors. So we have our own uh, aircraft sensor that's based on the same technology we're flying in space. And this is an example of uh, of a, a plume we saw in the U.S. Um, so, uh, of course, because we fly much closer to the ground, you're looking at a much uh, lower detection threshold. So instead of 100 kilograms per hour, you're looking at 10 kilograms per hour uh, or so of uh, of methane that we can detect. So these two are, uh, these two methods are actually complementary, and we use them in concert. And uh, and actually, um, I wanted to introduce you to a, a study we've just conducted uh, this summer with the European Space Agency. So we performed a joint uh, a joint aircraft and satellite campaign in Poland, and uh, the European Space Agency is using our data to validate their own data from the Copernicus um, constellation. And the results are, are showing very good correlation between the airborne sensor and and the satellite uh, satellite measurements, and uh, it it uh, it kind of paves the way to to perform further work here in uh, in using different technologies, but also to cross validate them uh, to cross validate the results between the different technologies. So, uh, to share some examples with you of what this looks like. Uh, this particular example here was uh, was measured with our satellite uh, on the left and with our aircraft on the right about a day apart. And uh, you can see uh, the uh, the good correlation here, not only in the the the, the location, the location, the accuracy of, of where the the emissions came from, um, you know, and and uh, w with both the satellite and especially with the aircraft, of course, because the resolution is is greater than uh, um, far greater than the satellite, but also the estimates are also very close. So this uh, this helps uh, gaining confidence in the um, the accuracy of of uh, not just the measurements, but the 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 methods that are used to go from concentration to uh, to emission rate um, with these measurements. And the the other one, uh, these two measurements were not taken uh, very closely together, but actually uh, it's still relevant in illustrating how um, persistent this particular uh, this particular source is. Uh, so these were taken um, uh, about about seven months, six, seven months apart. And you can see that uh, with the satellite on the left and the uh, and and the aircraft on the right, the, the measurements once again, uh, and correlate very, very nicely. So, so uh, again, this is a this is one uh, one one study, one data point, but it's um, it's encouraging enough to continue doing this and and uh, um, and determining just uh, just how uh, satellites um, can contribute to uh, to the pictures that were, the, the picture that we were talking about earlier in terms of of going from MRV to comparing that with with top down. And bottom up and top down, and and getting a, a much uh, a much better uh, estimate, and narrowing the uh, the error band as we go. 
So a few a few key points I want to leave you with. Um, so um, high resolution um, methane monitoring with satellites is here today. It's happening right now. We're generating data every day. We're getting uh, between 30 and 40 plumes every day. Um, and this would only increase as we launch more satellites. Um, as you saw, the emissions can be pinpointed very precisely, and then it can be done accurately and repeatedly, which again is becomes key when we're looking at uh, determining how persistent emissions are, how constant they are as well in terms of magnitude. Uh, and then with uh, that increased collaboration with um, different technologies um, and different platforms, uh, the data can be used to, to eventually for uh, for inventory and uh, and policy making. So, so that's it. That's uh, that's it for me today. So thank you. Look forward to uh, the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Francois. Uh, I think this is a relatively new topic for this crowd. So it's very exciting to hear all the developments that are happening. And I think the audience will have a lot of questions for actually both of our speakers um, on this topic. So I hope you stay around after the session as well and have a chance to talk to you. Um, the next speaker today um, is Riley Duran, who is a chief executive officer of a nonprofit organization, Carbon Mapper, with a mission to deliver accountable, actionable uh, methane and carbon dioxide data globally. Additionally, he is a research scientist at the University of Arizona and engineering fellow at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. From 2008 and to 2019, he served as a chief systems engineer at JPL's Earth Science Directorate, spanning, spanning NASA satellites and airborne programs, research, applied science and technology development. He is a research, uh, his research team con um, continues to develop and test multi-scale greenhouse gas monitoring frameworks that integrate Earth um, that integrate Earth um, observations from surface, air, and space to address multiple decision support applications. One of the offshoots of that research program is the Carbon Mapper public-private partnership to launch constellation of satellites capable of monitoring at least 80% of world's high emission methane and CO2 point sources at facility scale. Um, please take it away, Riley. Um, and I, I had to suppress a, a, a giggle when uh, Dr. Karakan uh, pointed out a mine, but I, with a quick glimpse, I realized that um, one of the NASA aircraft is actually surveying that, not that facility, but that whole region today. And so it was, it was actually, this was not coordinated at all, but uh, um, so yeah, I'm going to, uh, so a number of the speakers have hit, touched on some points that I will, so I'll try to skim through some of those and try to provide um, a bigger picture um, summary. So kind of playing on this theme that we've heard earlier is uh, we, if, if it hasn't come across already is we're seeing an emerging system of systems for methane monitoring, not limited to coal, but basically all sectors. And um, the, the, what, the work I'm gonna share today is based on um, a research program that's been underway at NASA and other federal agencies for over a decade. We referred to it variously as a tiered observing system or a system of systems, and the artist concept here conveys the general concept of combining surface measurements, uh, low altitude measurements, high altitude airborne measurements, and satellite observations with the goal of bringing together and bridging the gaps between uh, different sensor technologies, uh, estimation methods, and look at the problem from multiple scales towards overall improving general awareness and understanding. Um, one thing that often gets, I think, uh, merged and conflated in this space is that they're really at a, at a high level there are two types of monitoring when it comes to methane and I've, I kind of call it type one and type two. So type one is focused more at aggregate scale accounting inventories. How are we doing at the scale of a region, a nation state, the world, the global methane pledge? How are we doing at that scale? And a lot of times it's the um, it's the how much uh, question. Whereas Type two is more focused at very fine scale, actionable uh, direct mitigation guidance. And this is somewhat, this is often the, the why and where, right? So it's towards improving understanding about why we're seeing the emissions we're seeing, where they're happening, and can, in particular, can we identify um, anomalous outlier behavior where things are diverging from our, um, what we think we're doing. Uh, and so these two things overlap. Some of the technologies you've heard about today touch on both, but it's important to know which of these things you're talking about. Um, 
I think when you're evaluating data and observing systems. So I'll try to touch on some of this. Also, I think as it's also evident, you can see just the dramatic progress with GHG sat in space, other satellites in space, uh, um, improvements in surface-based technology estimation method. The modeling is, you know, the facility scale modeling is truly impressive, but there's still gaps. And one of the big gaps I think that we talk about in this forum is how do we scale up to operational systems that you can use on a regular basis, not the one-off research project, right? So we go beyond publishing a paper or press release, but we got to get to where we're not talking about this in conferences someday. This is routine, you know, steady state operations. So some of those gaps have to do with timeliness, latency, completeness in space and time, accessibility and transparency of the data, uh, technical capacity for stakeholders, people who can in interpret some of this advanced data and put it to use on the ground. Right. There's a lot of work to be done there, particularly in developing economies and then finance. How do you scale up and sustain these systems? So bottom line, and just to echo um, what others have said is you can't do this all within system. It takes a portfolio and remote remote sensing is one contributor, but because it's new, we'll talk a little bit more about it. The other thing to understand is that when it comes to methane fluxes, and I'll talk about emissions primarily here, there are two basic types of, of, of emission. And this is important to understand because it gets to limitations and capabilities of these systems and where they're best suited. So at a very high level, there's two types of methane emission. There's a high emission point source and their area emissions. What I mean by an area emission is something that's spread out typically over kilometers, it's more diffuse. It can be uh, a good example of this, probably the best example is rice um, cultivation or, or enteric fermentation with cattle. Or if you live in a city like I do in Los Angeles, you know, with millions of homes and natural gas, it's millions of tiny leaks everywhere that manifest collectively as a big blob. That's what we call an area source, and that has certain implications both on monitoring and um, observations. I would say in many cases, abandoned mines behave in this way, right, in terms of how they manifest in the atmosphere. Whereas high emission point sources, not all of which are super emitters. Super emitter applies a skewed distribution, but a high emission point source means a very spatially condensed plume. John Francois's examples with GHG sat is perfect, right? It shows a condensed plume, a stream of gas that you can readily detect with a um, uh, with a with a remote sensing sensor. That tends to be more correlated 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 with active coal production, both surface and underground mines. So just some some terminology here. Why are we even talking about remote sensing with mines? If we had surface measurements everywhere and they were perfect, you know, who would be talking about airplanes and satellites? But you know, the fact is, is, is we've seen is that you know mining is distributed over fairly large areas, and so when you spread stuff out over large areas, remote sensing can be a powerful tool because it is can be more efficient in some ways, cost effective than doing everything everywhere. But again, it needs to be matched with the appropriate surface measurements to pin it together. So just some examples of uh, methane emissions across uh, North America. And um, and China and I, I'm also laughing at John Francois is that we, there's a little pin here um, that I think all of us have seen. This is in the south, southeastern British Columbia. I'll show you an example of it. One mine in particular you see because it's the only dot that shows up in uh, in Canada so far. So what I'm going to do now is a, a little intro to methods. This is an example of um, a multi a multi scale study that we've been conducting across the U.S. And this is an example in southwestern Pennsylvania using two different technologies. So on the left is a map of methane emissions over southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, uh, scale is about 100 kilometers on the side here, and it's derived from observations from the European uh, Sentinel-5 precursor satellite, Tropomi, which is designed to measure the whole Earth every day at fairly coarse resolution. Each pixel in the satellite image is about seven kilometers across. And what we've done here is we've taken that into an atmospheric transport model, generated a flux inversion. So we've, we've got a map of emissions, and what's important here is not the colors, because I don't trust the satellite at this scale to tell me where the emissions are, but the net amount of methane in this scene, we can quantify to pretty good accuracy, better than plus or minus 20%. And that regional number is about 113 plus or minus 32,000 kilograms an hour, averaged over a month. Okay, so this is the, the net emissions from that region. The black circles are individual methane point sources, those high emission sources within that domain. And we got those by flying our aircraft with another technology I'll talk about in a minute, that individually resolves each of these point sources. So each of these little purple plumes are an individual methane point source emission. And this, on this map, the larger plumes happen to be from underground mine shaft vents, so they're active venting. The smaller plumes, you'll see a bunch of little ones all around it, peppered around it, is gas production activity. So it's wellheads, gathering lines, um, compressor stations. So it has nothing to do, in many cases, with coal. But the point is, is that between these two methods, we're getting a synoptic understanding of all the point sources in the region above our detection limit, in this case of about 10 kilograms an hour methane, 
And we've got the regional context of how do these point sources contribute it to the regional total and how do I trend it over time? So this is just one example. And so again, putting together net regional constraints with the high emission point source data, now we can start to say, well, what we're not seeing are the area sources. And so now you're starting to get more synoptic understanding. The way we do the point source stuff, similar concept um, to what John Francois talked about. In this case, we're using an imaging spectrometer, so it's a push broom sensor. And this is technology that's been developed at NASA over the last three decades or so. And what we're able to do with this is to both image and quantify methane plumes at fairly fine scale with this. With the aircraft, we can do this to about three meters resolution. With the satellites, we'll do it to about 30 meters. We also detect and quantify CO2 emissions, point sources from this, and, and estimate flare temperatures where we see flaring. So we have a pretty, pretty wide capability sensor. This is interesting because when you see a combustion source, you can actually start to estimate combustion efficiency by combining these three variables. OK, so when we step back and look at doing these studies over many regions across the US, we've now done this at six regions and counting. I've only got five here is California, central parts of the US, Marcellus Shale. Each of these little red points are where we've done these focus studies by having the satellites stare at the region and give us a net number. And then the this aircraft are giving us the point source estimate. So this plot on the right summarizes the result. We just published this in the journal PNAS. The blue bars are the net emissions for each region. So here's the Marcellus Shale. Here's the Permian, right? And then the little bars on the right with different colors are the net emissions from the point sources we detected with the airplane over the same domain at the same time. So a lot of these regions see oil and gas is dominating. Then the Marcellus coal is actually the higher emission source. And we again, we know it's coal because we can resolve this to individual mine shafts and pieces of equipment. Other cases, you'll see things like livestock waste management. So that's the general idea. The big picture takeaway from this is when we do these sorts of studies, we find that, uh, generally speaking, between 20 and 60 percent of the regional total emissions come from a, a handful of facilities. So these are the so-called high emission point sources or super emitters because they disproportionately uh, uh, cause the emissions. So if you look at this it varies quite a bit by region, right, as you would expect, right? Which sector dominates and it varies a lot by how much production is happening, whether it's oil and gas or coal or landfills, et cetera. The other key thing is intermittency. So this, if we didn't drive it home enough with the coal examples, this is a map of methane emissions in the Permian Basin from oil and gas production uh, over the course of several weeks. We're flying several times a day, and you can just see how the emissions are changing. Now, you'd look at that and you'd say, that's it's impossible to catch all these things because they're never persistent for more than a few hours. Actually, if you stared at it, you would see some of these sources never go away. So they're persistent but variable versus intermittent. And this is important to understand because we don't want people chasing process emissions like a vapor relief valve. We do want to understand where something's persisting and it's more variable than it should be or something that's just st just stuck on all the time. Big problem in the oil and gas industry. Um, and so obviously we need more frequent sampling if we're going to get this right. OK, so just a quick summary of where we've done this. I'll, I'll just summarize but with the air claims. What I'll summarize is that in most cases where we look at active uh, uh, coal production, as, as other speakers have said, the highest emission sources we see are from ventilation shafts, not a big surprise. So then the question is, are they performing as you would expect? We do see some underground, um, I'm sorry, some above ground emissions from surface mines that are surprisingly large, but that's usually an outlier. In most cases, we do not detect point sources with the airplane down to 10 kilograms an hour over surface mines. And so you may ask, well, why are we seeing that? This is a raw image of that same area in Southwest Pennsylvania I was talking about a minute ago. And so what you're seeing here is a grayscale image where we've mosaic together all the flight lines from the aircraft. And this is where we're heading from space. We're going to do this over large regions every day at some point. But what you're seeing is the black is where there's not much methane. The white is there's a lot of methane. And the pins indicate individual sources we've been able to identify on the ground with high resolution imaging. Within about 70 centimeters, we know where it's coming from. So in this area, again, a good chunk of what you're seeing is coal and the rest is mostly oil and gas if you landfills up here. So this is what we get in the raw data. And then we, you know, like what John Francois does, we segment this out and we say for this plume, we know the we know the wind des the, the wind speed, we can estimate an emission rate. This table I put up here just to summarize a little bit to be provocative on how you can get it wrong. Okay, so all I did here is I took four major mine complexes. We added up all of the emissions from the from the uh, uh, observable point sources. And we said if you do this over several weeks and you get an average number, what does it result in? And you can compare it with the GHGRP. I say this is how you can get it wrong because I intentionally didn't put uncertainty estimates on this. And the second thing is intermittency and variability, right? So to get this right, you have to do enough sampling to say, well, what do I think the real average is over the year that accounts for seasonal variability? 
So this gets to observing strategy. It's ideally you're doing this every day. If you can't do it every day, then you ought to be doing it some regular cadence around the years. So you're getting a true average, not some you know maintenance event. But I will draw your attention to the bottom line is if you add up these four facilities as they agree pretty well in toto with the GHDRP. So, so I, I highlight this because I come back to my point about type one versus type two. If you're worried about the inventory, it may be pretty good, right? If you're concerned about what's happening in an individual mine shaft and is equipment working, that's maybe a different question. Alabama, I'm actually, my house, my hometown is right here. So Black Warrior Basin, we've done similar things there. As I speak, we've got another airplane down there looking at landfills and they just generated this image a few days ago. So very similar behavior to what we see in Pennsylvania. Emission rates are pretty consistent. Similar behavior, I think, in terms of general agreement with a GHDRP. So we're getting pretty good. So I did want to show this example back to you know, picking on British Columbia for a second. So we just completed a survey a few weeks ago with one of the NASA airplanes over um, a bunch of mines, probably 20 or 30 surface mines in Alberta and British Columbia. Very little methane at most of those facilities above our detection limit, but this one mine is if you look at this from minute to minute, these are snapshots that we took over the course of about an hour. You can see emissions emanating from the same spot and you can watch the wind moving around, right? You can see the plumes moving around. So, so if we look at the real time image from our instrument, right? So we, we, this is exactly what was happening at the surface when we flew over. The thing that we notice is that most of those big plumes are coming from fairly deep. It's like a fairly deep surface, deep, deep cut mine. So the hypothesis is it's deeper, gassier part of the mine. We, this is a this is pretty pretty significant mine. We usually don't see this kind of uh, behavior elsewhere. But I wanted to summarize it because I think it 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 um it, it backs up what John Francois was saying. We are seeing it. Um, so variability. Others have talked about variability. Obviously, if you sample on this day <laughs> or this hour, you're going to get it wrong. The idea is to develop sample strategies that that can you know basically Nyquist sample these systems. Another example, the San Juan mine. I think John Francois also showed this. We've been surveying this mine going back to 2015, whenever we fly over it. And so if you came along and you only sampled it in March, you would get this number. If you sampled it in May, you get this number. So the current research program that we have as a, as a society, and I characterize it still as fairly researchy, is this is what the state of the art is. Because until we get to daily or hourly sampling, you're dealing with these, you know, kind of, I call it campaign mode. So beware of getting a top line annual number with these estimates. OK, so how do we solve this, right? So in designing observing systems, particularly remote sensing, we've been advancing this concept of completeness. So if there's a population of emissions out there, and I'm not picking on coal here, I'm talking about all sectors. Completeness is how much methane is there? What fraction of it can you see? Completeness is a function of detection limit, spatial coverage, and sample frequency. We recently published a paper like this with Daniel Jacob at Harvard that basically says, it's the combination of your return time, your revisit interval, and your detection limit. So you want to be down in the bottom part of this curve. And this is this is assuming I sample 95% of all the stuff out there. And so our target with the Carbon Mapper program, which is a nonprofit um, program we put together to launch satellites to do um, more complete sampling, ultimately with this goal of getting to 80% globally, is that you end up, you try to end up in this part of the uh, curve. So just to give you a heads up of what we're going to be doing in the future, uh, we launched the first two demonstration satellites next fall. The gold areas here are our global survey deck. I say global, I mean near global. And the plan is to do this probably once or twice a year, is we can push broom all of the populated areas on the planet and look for just a first, a first census of at 30 meter resolution, where are the high emission point sources that are persistent. It's not going to give us any information on variability, but it tells us where are they. And that's going to be really important for things like landfills, which are pers generally persistent emitters. And then the purple areas are where we're going to hunker down and focus on these facilities as rapidly as we can. Facilities meaning regions with more activity than others, right? Some of these are pretty big areas. Uh, and as the constellation grows, the goal is to get this down to daily or sub-daily sampling so we can do the kind of monitoring I'm talking about. Now, one thing we haven't pointed out yet is when I talk about daily to sub-daily sampling, I'm assuming Mother Nature is behaving. So just as we're seeing right now in the North Sea trying to get this, you know, Nord Stream leak is that clouds are often your enemy. So if it's cloudy, you're not going to see it. So um, apply cloud screening to all of this. And then last but not least is this idea of a, of a constellation of satellites using TIP and Q. If uh, one of these wide area flux mappers sees something and they can task GHG, SAT, or us to follow up on it, then these, these smaller satellites is what they're designed to do is to basically target. So in summary, 
Advanced remote sensing has the potential to quantify and guide reductions. Um, however, it really depends. I, I think in this in this particular sector, the most critical advance will be higher frequency sampling because of the variability. Um, we're going to still need the surface measurements to put this in the right context because again, because of variability and things the satellites don't see, like some of the drainage and some surface emi area source emissions that no satellite is going to get in the near term. And I think that the last point is I think we're we we're asked maybe to comment on costs. I just want to make an, uh, an editorial comment that in, in this field, I don't think monitoring costs is the rate limit at all. The rate limit is incentives and the economics it's solved with addressing some of these things. We, we know that mine vents release methane, but it's not the monitoring costs. It's not. That's a different conversation in other sectors, right? Oil and gas, this is very much a conversation, but um, anyway, that's my point on cost. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, this has been an amazing panel. I think it's safe to say that all of us learned something in this room between underground measurements to measurements from from space. Uh, really so much information. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into question because we don't have that much time left. Um, and I know this this audience has had a lot of questions in recent in the previous panels. Go ahead. Thanks very much for the prize. I was definitely learned something, lots of things. Um, so I, I am curious. So like it's it's great that like a lot of the business process I do is about helping people waste less. And so it's great that you can do a baseline, you can do analysis, you can plan, execute, and report. So how does how does your ability to put in the model that anticipates and then it's verified with the measurement, and then we contact the guy in Russia with his mind, he doesn't want to talk to you. Like how how does that get uh, relayed through? Is it still the policy that's driving these things, and now we see non-compliance, and then it's a regulatory driven action, or is there an ROI case for the folks that are ultimately wasting this? And do they have a clear action plan to implement once they know the magnitude of their point source emission? That's ultimately how we make the improvement, right? Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Well, um, if there's a financial incentive, um, there's an ROI case. <laughs> Quite simply, um, you know, there can be a significant uh, ROI case. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, in a broader perspective, I mean, we are looking at, um, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it regulatory programs, um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, international cooperation, you know, that type of thing would be uh, principal drivers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you for an ROI, um, you know, there's there's definitely got to be some type of, um, you know, penalty or market incentive or something of that nature on a facility specific basis. I'll, I'll just add that um, a, a regulatory incentive like, kind of goes hand in hand with that. But um, but personally, like on our side, what we found is as a whole, this industry has been um, a little bit less responsive than the oil and gas industry for a variety of reasons, right? Like so um, maybe it's a little bit more depressed than the oil and gas industry in terms of in terms of available resources or you know financial resources, but but more importantly, there's challenges in in capturing and doing something with this methane. It's not it's not necessarily easy. There's there's all sorts of different things that so they know they're emitting as as Riley pointed out. Like it's not a especially for um, for the underground mines. Like we're we're telling them something they know. Um, but um, so far, they I guess they've lacked the incentives to to try to put you know use the technologies that are now available to do this because they exist. So, um, Martin, go ahead. Hi again, uh, meeting Turkish School Enterprises. Thanks for the excellent uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> I'm very curious about correlation between methods. Uh, as Ry Riley emphasized, uh, there are some statistics. And um, in John's presentation, I saw that there are some correlation between two methods. I think they were airborne and satellite measurements. So what do you think which, um, which method 
is the best for you and the other one uh, what is the highest source of the uh, methane emissions is it landfill or to do statistics as far as i know thank you so so everybody wants a, a winner and a, and a best technology and uh I, I think you've heard from both riley and i and i don't want to speak for you but I, you know satellites are, are one tool airplane airplanes are another and there's there's other technologies that are very valuable and helpful in situ monitors for example that can provide the kind of daily daily data that that uh, that's been discussed here and, and and emphasized so so um they all play a really important role it really depends on you know you're, you're trying to get the full spectrum you know um what was your and your second question what are the biggest uh, emissions well um coal mines and landfills are are having a, a pretty good fight so um, some of the landfills that we see are, are absolutely massive and and some of the coal mines as well um so they're, and they're both quite persistent like yeah every time you every time you look at them they're they're emitting on a on a pretty uh, pretty consistent basis so um I, I think the answer to the the best sensors are the ones that are that work and they're operating and they're scaled up. And I think that's, that's. I mean, that's the, I think the point we're trying to make is that this is all promising. We're seeing um, nascent buildup and capability. We're still some ways away from a fully operational system at scale globally. And so at the moment, I think, um, you know, the market will sort out, you know, winners and losers, but we're so far away from that. And the, just the, the point John Francois made is that, um, these different methods often complement each other. And you know, one example is you can use one type of satellite technology to say this general area is emitting a lot of methane. Well, why is that? Well, let's go apply the high resolution satellites to go look and they find out, you know what, this particular sector, you know, landfills or coal mines or whatever is generating more methane than we think. And then you come in with the guys with the airplanes to get down to the, you know, the smallest possible uh, detection limit. And then you want people with drones to come in and then people have got to be walking around in the mine, right? So, I mean, it is this idea of a tiered observing system as you hand off information between each other, right? Um, so it isn't a question of best. And as far as biggest sectors, look, the, the the cow in the room is agriculture, right? I mean, the, the biggest two thirds, two thirds of the anthropogenic methane budget are waste sector and ag. But we have to, th if, if we're talking, especially at this conference about the Global Methane Pledge and something we want to do at the end of this decade, you have to think about what's actionable. So if you take the Global Methane Pledge 30% target, and you can play this game, ask yourselves how much of the existing oil and gas emissions need to be reduced by this decade waste sector and ag and what's technically and economically viable and a lot of people looking at those scenarios will say well we need to slash oil and gas emissions by about 70 percent we probably need to slash waste sector emissions by about 50 percent and that's technically feasible we ought to set a target for the coal sector if it's feasible and we need to get working now on r d to solve the ag solution because it ain't going to happen before the end of this decade but we got to start working on the, the science now Quick question on the uh, uh, aerial imagery. You guys have a lot of data. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you intend to to organize this, share this, publish? Um, how how do you plan to, to use the information? Well, we um, yeah, there's there's different models, right? So we we're obviously a commercial company, but we also um, contribute our data to the International Methane Emissions Observatory, for example, and ultimately. Um, a system like that that can aggregate all the emissions, make like kind of you know um, bring it all together, um, it will be will be very powerful, and that that's where uh, that's where a lot of energy is is being spent right now. But I'll I'll pass it over to Ryan. Yeah, so I think the the idea of the different models, and this is where I think a lot of it we're having a bunch of side meetings this week with the UN and others talking about in State Department. Um, so I think there's actually actually two approaches. One is um, uh, and we've been pi we've been piloting this. I know you guys have two internationally. We've been piloting this in about five U.S. states so far, where we do two things. One is is we try to share data as quick as we get it, like qualitative data. We saw a big emission event at this location. We share it with the operator because we often know who the operator is, and they go out and they do follow up measurements to verify it, maybe fix it. And there's you know there's some effort required, and that usually takes place on timescales of days. 
At the other end of the scale is we are also trying to publish everything we see. So Carbon Mapper is a nonprofit. We'll publish every bit of the methane and CO2 data we collect globally. But right now, as we're doing that on about a 90-day rolling basis, there's two reasons for that. One is to make sure we get the emissions right, and it's been quality controlled, and there's uncertainty estimates, so we're not putting out crap. <laughs> and secondly, is that we we want to give the operators time to fix things, right? So we're trying to, if we're trying to optimize for mitigation potential, was we want to get maximum participation from the operators, regulators, and civil society without pushing people away, while maintaining transparency for public trust. Right. And so that's this is if it sounds like a bit of a social experiment, it is. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot of people, you know, smart people working on how to get it right. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Clark. So Clark, you have worked in uh, many different countries. Mm -hmm. Some interesting learning uh, based on your experience. Uh, how many countries or in general companies have been conducting continuous uh, emissions monitoring on site? either uh, voluntarily or as part of the regulatory requirement. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Han Lang, for that, that question. Um, you know, generally speaking, um, continuous monitoring, so, so I guess you can think of it in two ways. Continuous monitoring is being practiced for mine safety. Um, it's not unusual in China, US, um, you know, Australia and other countries to go underground. I mean, there's methane sensors, there's flow meter, you know, flow uh, flow meters, you know, there's, so there's continuous monitoring. Um, even at, you know, I was at a, a you know, uh, Felicia and I were at a mine in China uh, down in uh, Guizhou province. I mean, it's a pretty small mine and, you know, they had this control, amazing control room. <laughs> But in terms of actual emissions monitoring, um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, I think it's it's definitely, you know, been practiced in the UK, um, although there's no actually working underground mines anymore in the UK, um, you know, Germany, US, Australia, um, I, you know, I, you know, we had a, a continuous monitors on a project we worked at on in China, but it, it's not. Uh, for emissions, but it's not common practice. Or if it is, it's not made known. <laughs> I mean, you, you may have different experience, but that that's kind of my experience. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we can, we can use the um, mine measure data, the safety measure data is a a, a reasonable proxy. And, and here I'm talking about mine ventilation, I'm, I'm you know, uh, Methane drainage is a bit different. I mean, typically in China and other countries, I mean, there are uh, methane sensors and, and flow meters at, at the drainage stations on the surface. So you get real time measurements. Yeah, you know, in your, you know, we're all presuming uh, wherever we go that those are regularly calibrated and accurate. But, um, you know, I think that data is, is generally reliable if it's recorded you know, reliably. Um, but for uh, ventilation measurements, we're using a lot of times um, safety measure data for as a, as a proxy. Um, but, uh, you know, that there can be plus or minus, you know, 20 percent, you know, variation from it, what, what may actually be coming out uh, of the shaft. First of all, thanks for all the presenters. Excellent presentations. In fact, I have three questions. Two, yeah, but not long, don't worry. <laughs> Two, uh, to Mr. Jean, uh, regarding the remote sensing applications uh, when measuring the methane. You have mentioned in your presentation about some accuracy of the data obtained with the satellites and they are ranging from 35% to 60% plus minus. Uh, is it enough uh, for the implementation of a project or for an investment, or is, it is, uh, does it need to validation from any other sources? For example, the bottom-up applications, like, like Özgen mentioned in his presentation, or any other aspects. And the, the second question is, uh, is there any problem collecting data of a mine that belonging to some specific person or entity or company uh, to get information without 
their or its permission. Well, with the uh, when we look at the, from the legacy side, do you need any permission to collect information of emission belonging to a, some special person or company? And the last question to Mr. Özgen. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you have you have mentioned uh, the quality of the methane that in the Appalachian region. Uh, what is the utilization area of this methane? It is used directly for the pipeline as a natural gas pipelines or and for another purposes, generation electricity or some uh, thermal uh, thermal applications. Thank you very much. OK, so um, we'll start with uh, with the second one because it's it's, a, it's an easy one to answer. So we do not need permission to take imagery anywhere with our satellites. It's essentially the same with with aircraft sensors, but um, we also don't want to make, uh, you know, really essentially piss people off. So so there's there's a, you know, there's a there's a balance here. You know, we we try to educate as to what we're doing. That there's no, for example, like military component to what we're doing. We're we're measuring at 25 meter resolution. This is not, you know, high resolution imagery. But even on that in that case, you, you look at, you know, commercial imaging companies that look at like Maxar that take imagery at 30 centimeter resolution. They don't need permission. They're doing that all over China, all over North Korea. You know, so. Um, so it's um, in the end, n nothing prevents us from from taking uh, taking those uh, those measurements. Um, and now, yes, I mean there there's an error rate associated with these with these measurements. You, there's no there's not much of a way around that. Uh, most of that contribution comes from wind. Um, so that's the biggest factor. And and we're measuring concentration in our measurements, and then we need to do. Uh, uh, various uh, calculations. The, the one that we uh, favor most of the time is called integrated mass enhancement, um, and and we tend to, we we're very transparent about what the method what methods we use. We've published a peer reviewed paper on it, uh, but yes, I mean there will always be that uncertainty, but uh, that's why doing the cross validation with other measurements, especially on the ground closer to the source, can help. But by the way, all these measurements methods have uncertainty as well. You just can't get away from it. So um, but what, what's so the you know the, these percentages look big, but what you're trying to figure out is is this a few hundred kilograms per hour or is it you know thousands and thousands of kilograms per hour? The error band will still keep you in that right range and, and let you know, give you a good idea of what you're looking at. And and again, like if you're really looking at inventories, then of course you need to try to um, to, to to increase the accuracy, reduce the, uh, the the width of that error band, and and using different technologies can can help with that. Uh, for, for, I mean, the the the, the gasification gas gas is used for uh, pipe as pipeline gas, and also from the gulp gas boreholes, it's also pipeline gas because it's high purity, really. Uh, it, it has very little, if any, uh, contamination from the mine air. But if you, again, it, it, it depends on the, on the mine characteristics. If you go up to Northern Appalachian Basin, for example, there is high contamination in the gulp gas uh, from the mine air. So, so part of that gas is uh, used to drive the pumps and most of it is released to the atmosphere. Thank you. We're going to wrap up this panel. This is way past time. Thank you for staying, everybody. Um, this has been really great. Uh, and another round of thanks for our amazing speakers today. So, and I want to be sure everybody gets uh, a refreshment upstairs. And we're back yet for 4 p.m. <laughs>